Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. Uh, with me, my colleague, Clay Jones. Good evening, Clay. Good evening, Buford. Well, uh, you seem to think there's a whole lot going on these days. There is just so much going on throughout our country. Connecticut, uh, Vermont, uh, Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri, w Wisconsin, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. I honestly do believe they've lost. <coughs> well, I'm looking particularly Colorado, California, and Washington all have petition movements going on to get marijuana legalization referenda on the ballots in November. And it looks like they're having no trouble getting enough signatures no to get them in well. place. And <clears throat> the way I'm reading the tea leaves, uh, I'm going to say that in at least two of the states it's going to pass. All three, not impossible. I think Connecticut, you've got a governor that's waiting for the bill. Uh, that's a marijuana, uh, medical marijuana bill. Medical isn't marijuana. It? Yeah. Last year they did the yeah. decrim. Yeah. And this year they're, they're going to do the marijuana. Yeah. Vermont, uh, they have the Speaker of the House up there is trying to hold it up. Yeah. Trying to do the same thing as Lamar Smith here federally. Yeah. Um, but Wisconsin's got a strong movement. It's all over. Yeah. Um, the only bad thing I'm seeing is places like Montana. Well, Montana is a very strange situation. Uh, and even there, uh, it's starting to look as if some sort of accommodation may be working its way out. Uh, the problem is there are a whole lot of extreme right Republicans that have a majority in the legislature that have been trying to undo the popular referendum on medical marijuana. And uh, it's, it's led to a real struggle. Legislatively, there are limits to what extent the legislature can set aside a popular referendum. There are limits on what they can do. Uh, the U.S. Attorney for the state uh, has been bringing some charges uh, on large-scale distributors. Uh, but these are the large-scale distributors that the state set up. Okay, but uh, that's the same thing that we see out in California, uh, where the U.S. Attorneys in California are reading the state laws as not authorizing anyone to make any money off of marijuana. They're claiming that everything should be done strictly nonprofit, uh, and so those, those highly publicized busts have been at upper level distributors right. uh, who are frankly in business. But the other side to it is they are, frankly, pretty damned unsuccessful. They, they raid distributors, they trash the place up, they shut them down. Take their money, take their profits. And then nothing happens, and the next week someone else is doing the job. Yes, I agree. It's, it's harassment, and it... That's it, strictly what it is. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like they're in their last rows, and... We're yeah. throwing our little uh, fit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think the same thing in, in Michigan, which has had all sorts of trouble. It, yes. They're two years into their program, and very little is happening. But it's starting to look like some sort of accommodation is being worked out. Yes. Uh, several of the cities have fallen in line with finding some way to allow medical marijuana systems to operate. Yeah. The, the, the real problem is that if we look at K-12 
California, Colorado, uh, and to some extent Washington. It's developed into a quasi business model mm -hmm. with manufacturers, in this case growers, distributors, wholesalers, and then in effect retail outlets. Right. The people who <coughs> put the laws together and to some extent the patients visualized it as a one level thing where at most you would have co-ops that would get together, grow their own stuff and, and exchange mm -hmm. it back and forth. So, so what we're having here is the success of the programs have pushed the states further than the states ever expected to go. The U.S. attorneys view it as looking more like the same distributor system they see in the illegal markets <clears throat> and they don't like it. But the bottom line is that they have not been able to shut it down or even slow it down in any of these states. Oh, it, it, it's just going gangbusters. Yeah. It, but going back to Washington, now their referendum up there mm -hmm. is no felonies. They're dropping all marijuana felonies. Okay. And there will only be misdemeanors. Is it misdemeanors? I thought Washington had already gone to an offense level. Uh, well, what they're doing is they're dropping everything back. The, uh, the felonies aren't going to For be charged. Okay. They can only charge you with misdemeanors okay. rather than felonies. Okay. But basically what that does is it pushes the whole marijuana issue right into the Fed's lap. We can't well, prosecute them. Uh, you can arrest them. You're going to have to prosecute them. Well, as, as I was mentioning to you before we went on the air, that... If any one of those states fully legalizes as far as state law is concerned, it's all over. That if you look at the total personnel of the DEA, they've got 5,000 agents worldwide. That's smaller than the Los Angeles police force. Oh, yeah. If you take the entire federal court system all across the country, and you look at all of the federal criminal mm. cases they handle in a year's time, that's fewer than the number of marijuana possession cases in California in a year. Yeah. There is just absolutely no way that the DEA could, say, come into Houston and do street-level marijuana law enforcement against street corner transactions. They just can't do it. So, <coughs> especially if two of the three states legalize. Uh, federal enforcement's over. It's finally going to force Congress's hand w one way or another. And Congress no longer has the votes to carry through the law on war on drugs. I mean, if you went into the House of Representatives today and said, let us have twice as many DEA agents, and oh, by the way, we need twice as many federal judges and U.S. attorneys, can you imagine what Congress would do to that kind of request? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you see one state on the West Coast legalized, yeah. or should I say completely defelonized? No, I'm... They're, well, okay, defiantalized, but Colorado and California both would remove all state criminal penalties is, right. for production, distribution, possession, or use. They'd still have driving under the influence. They'd still have no delivery to a minor. They'd still have oh, yeah. no deliveries around school zones, but more like, more like the alcohol laws are. And I honestly think that you'll see if one state does it on the West Coast, Maine and Rhode Island will follow suit. Uh, I'm not sure they'll be the first. Remember, 
Massachusetts two years ago decriminalized without even breaking a sweat. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've had no trouble with it. I think they've got a medical marijuana bill in front of yes. them right now. Yes. It, it's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's at the point that it, it's almost ridiculous to think of them trying to enforce this. Well, the funny thing is there's, there's a counter move that seems to be getting the drug warriors in deep doo-doo all across the country. Several states this year have either passed or are in the process of passing statutes that uh, would require applicants for welfare benefits to take drug tests. As well as unemployment. As, as well as unemployment. Uh, the unemployment, they're screaming, well, they've got to get jobs in drug-free workplace positions, so why not? But uh, these, these kinds of drug test laws have already been declared unconstitutional every time the federal courts have looked at them. Uh, the Supreme Court's been pretty consistent that there has to be some sort of reason shown why the drug test is necessary for public safety. That's why it's okay to make an airline pilot or a bus driver pee in a cup, but not a secretary. What and, about a cop who carries a gun? Okay. He's got the, the my life at the uh, end of that gun. The federal law would allow for the drug testing of police, but Across the country, police and firefighters both have extremely strong unions and good collective bargaining agreements. And the police unions have managed to keep any city anywhere in the country from imposing drug testing. So here, here are the cops that are out busting the kid for one marijuana joint are banding together to keep the city from testing to see if they've had any. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Yeah. And when we get right down to it, if we look at uh, the Florida law, and this, this is, I think, quite ironic. Uh, their law and most of these others that are in process require the applicant to pay for the drug test. So someone without a job, without any money, needing welfare, has to come up with 30 to 50 bucks to pay for the drug test. But the law says that if they pass the test, we give you your money back. the state refunds the money to them. In California, I mean in, in Florida, when the Tried it out, yes. less than 2% of the people tested tested positive. So they didn't save any Which money. meant in 98% of the cases, the state had to refund the money. Now, generally, when there have been tests of some kind done in the general population as a whole, it runs about 6% positive. So instead of poor people being a bunch of druggies, they're actually three times cleaner than the rest of us. So uh, I don't know how much Florida had to spend. I thought Florida's trying to do some uh, legislation that's going to uh, make all state employees uh, drug test. Uh, their governor's talking about it, but it doesn't stand any more chance of passing constitutional muster than the one that was just struck down. Uh, the problem is these laws are being done strictly for the public relations and political aspects of it. They have nothing to do with the real world or anything at all about it. And while we're at it, uh, one thing that uh, comes into play here. The federal government has a requirement 
that any public housing run by a city or county or state has to remove any tenement if any member of that person's family is convicted of a drug crime. Mm -hmm. Which means if the teenage son gets busted for selling a bag of weed. The grandson even. The grandson, his mother, his grandmother, and his baby sister all get kicked out on the street and can't go to any other public housing. Let's, that's a good place to let people think about it. We'll take a break and be back shortly. The whole idea of a drug-free America and zero tolerance really doesn't make much sense, does it? So it does make sense, however, to find ways to reduce the harms associated with drugs. And that's what I want to talk about. I better start thinking about whether it is really laws that make the difference on whether people use drugs or not. Al yeah. Alcohol didn't shoot people because he was intoxicated. Right, exactly. Those people are not fighting over drugs, they're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this unholy symbiosis between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. The war on drugs uh, isn't working. And uh, if anything, it's just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. Yes, I just left a message to encourage uh, Congressman Smith to allow H.R. Uh, Bill 2306 on the floor. Even though Lamar Smith has a district that's primarily in San Antonio, I'm sure he would welcome phone calls from any of you about uh, the marijuana problem in this country. So please use those numbers you saw on the screen. And speaking of phone calls, remember that this is your show. We always want to hear from you. So please call us with your comments or questions. Uh, if you're not watching us as we broadcast, you can email me at the address shown. I'll get right back to you, and we might use your comment on the air next time. So, and I understand we've... Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I've got a foolish question. I started okay. to ask this uh, during the break. So 
when a grandson, 15 years old, that's staying with their grandparents that's in their 70s because they're in public housing. Uh, probably because the grandkids' parents, one or both, are in prison. Yeah. Right. And here's his child gets arrested. Yeah. And the 70-year-old, 80-year-old people that are barely getting by uh, in the pu public housing, so they're going to put them on the street. And now we have a bunch more people that say, I have to hustle today so I can eat. Yeah. I got to hustle today so my kids can be in a motel tonight. Yeah. It's going to rain. Mm -hmm. What the hell's going wrong with our legislators? <laughs> you know, do you really want to call them our legislators? From what I'm They're hearing, they've been bought me. by someone else. They misrepresent me and I think the majority of the people in the United States. Well, you know, that's a story for another day and I won't get in. But I will say that Years ago, when I was more in touch with what's going on in the streets than I am now, most people think of drug dealers as someone with lots and lots of money who gets rich. But most drug dealers at the street level are users that are just hustling to get by. Back then, 20 years ago, and it was the same 10 years ago, the typical drug dealer was someone probably in their teens or 20s who was a cocaine or methamphetamine user. They would buy an eight ball, an eighth of an ounce of coke or meth. They may even get credit to buy it from their dealer. That would cost them, at that time, about $130. That eighth of an ounce could be broken down into 12 $20 packets. If they squeezed a little bit, they could get 14 out of it, mm -hmm. which meant mm -hmm. that they'd, if they kept two for their own use, they would manage to make about 40 to $50 a day. Mm -hmm. That was enough that if two of them went in together, they could get a cheap motel room for the night and buy a hamburger or two. Yep. And that's what these big, bad drug dealers look like. There is, you know, th when, when they arrest a drug dealer, street level. Which is uh, about all they ever arrest. Yeah. Right. And here's a, a person who has been selling these little bags of Coke or little yeah. bags of uh, marijuana, and he'll have a thousand dollars on him, and everybody thinks he's rich as can be. But he's gonna tomorrow. He's gonna go buy the product again before he can sell it. Or he may have to pay for tonight's product tonight. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't the money in there. I mean, you look at the the crystal meth thing. Now you have to sign and show an ID when you go buy a box of Sudafed. Mm -hmm. How many boxes of Sudafed does it take to make a batch of crack well, or uh, crystal meth? And let's, let's go a step further on that. Crystal meth is still and has been manufactured by the big line reputable pharmaceutical manufacturers since the 1930s. They can make over 105 milligram pills for a penny. Mm -hmm. How does that compare to the street price? <laughs> well, the, the, their profit is um, astronomical as well as the cartels. And I might also point out that not one of those legitimate pharmaceutical manufacturers has ever had a meth lab blow up and mess up the neighborhood they're in. No. It's just like the marijuana growers. If you take a farmer who is a legitimate farmer and he's growing corn or wheat or cotton, 
He's going to obey the laws. He's going to protect the environment. He's going to use his fertilizers responsibly. He's not going to put up booby traps around his field. The same thing would happen to marijuana farmers if it were legal. Legal meth manufacturers don't cause the problems that the little mom and pop people converting an ounce worth of Sudafed in a, in a soda bottle do. I mean, it seems to me that uh, buying the Sudafed, reducing it down to whatever you have to do to it to make your crystal meth. It's a, it's a messy chemical process. It's an, yes, but is there a profit from what you paid for the Sudafed? Uh, you know, most of that meth is not sold. Most of that's done by people who make a little bit for their own use. Okay. But yeah, there would be a profit. We need to look at the other side of that, though. I use one of those things for my allergies. Uh, and once a day, I can go and buy a box of tablets signing my name at the pharmacy counter. That once a month buy gives me about a 24-day supply. Whoops, <laughs> we've got a problem there. And I live in Houston. In Houston, there are a lot of 24-hour pharmacists. Yes. But you know, there are a lot of towns in Texas that don't have 24-hour pharmacists. And if your allergies get bad at midnight, you have to suffer until one opens at 8 or 9 the next morning. And you can go to even a bunch of even smaller towns in Texas. And guess what they've got? Nothing. Nothing. They don't even have a pharmacy. If you're living in some place like Idaho and have hay fever, you have to drive to the nearest city to get your blooming over-the-counter hay fever medicine. All to stop a handful, a small handful of people from making methamphetamine. Now the other side to that story is even if you shut down all of those mom and pop meth dealers, makers, it wouldn't affect the meth market at all. I suspect that their total amount manufactured is well under 10% of the math market. Most of it comes today from large factories in Mexico right. that use standard pharmaceutical techniques to turn out commercial quality pills. Most of the rest of the math in this country comes from legitimate pharmacies, either through prescriptions Forage prescriptions are robberies at the pharmacy. What most people don't realize is that methamphetamine is a legitimate, legal, pharmaceutical drug. It can be and regularly is prescribed by physicians for patients. Most of the patients that receive methamphetamine from their doctors are children. It's one of the standard treatments for attention deficit spectrum disorders. It's freely substitutable with <coughs> dextroamphetamine, which is normally sold as Adderall these days and Ritalin. And if you take any one of the three, your body's not going to be able to tell the difference. Uh, break time again. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. <laughs>
I'm not ready yet, please stop. Стоп, сказал дебил, блин. Добрый день. My name is Igor, and I'm a businessman from Moscow. Long time ago, when me and my friends from KGB, we served our motherland in Afghanistan in early 80s. We did not expect that the lost war will bring us new wonderful business opportunity, the ghetto in trade. Last time, I watched TV with my mother, and the United Nations officials said that Russia is number one consumer of heroin in the world, with an estimated two and a half million users. You know, we traffickers, we make billions of dollars from selling drugs to them. And then my mother told me, Igorochek, my dearest son, you will be infinitely grateful to the United Nations for keeping this market illegal. Otherwise, we would never buy that nice Renaissance palace in Venice last summer. Nice old woman, wise and with a good sense of humor. But the TV also said that some Western bastards trying to convince my government to introduce methadone to treat addicts with this substitute drug. And here, I absolutely agree with my ex-comrade from KGB, Gospodin Ivanov, who is, by the way, the head of Federal Anti-Narcotic Agency. And he said, no way to let methadone in this country. And he means it. Otherwise, how would we buy gas for our yachts? if not selling drugs to those junkies. Thank you, United Nations. Спасибо, объединенные нации. Спасибо за прохибищен. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, Clayton, we've got a big meeting coming up here in Houston next month. Tell us a little oh, about it. Oh, th there's going to be a wonderful conference at the Rice University, uh, James uh, Baker Institute. And the title of the conference is <coughs> The War on Drugs Has Failed. Is Legalization the Answer? That's going to be on March 8th and 9th. Uh, we've got some really good people coming in to speak. Nathan Edelman. Um, Rick Stevens is going to open up the uh, conference. Yeah. And he's the man that's on Channel 8 that's uh, Rick Stevens, Europe. He, he's Woodward's. the big guru on travel in Europe and has become very active in marijuana legalization. And that'll be at 7 o'clock Thursday night. And then a Friday morning, it starts at uh, 8.30. And there's going to be people like Ethan Nadelman, uh, John Coleman. He used to be a uh, former assistant director of the, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, there, there's going to be some plenums going on all day long with different people. And I think that it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for people right here to really get understand what's going on with this drug war without having to travel halfway across the country. Uh, as I understand, they're expecting quite a crowd. Yes. So it is invitation only, but if you go to the Baker website 
Baker Institute website. Uh, you can ask for an invitation, and if they're not already full, they'll be sure and put you on the list. So it's well worth the opportunity. Well, I know I'll be there. Okay. Um, but, uh, I mean, these things are going on everywhere all yeah. the time now. Yeah. And, you know, the title is not nearly as off the wall as it sounds. This is the kind of title we're hearing all around the world on conferences these days. The drug war has failed, and it's yeah. coming out, and it, it's now people are starting to say the drug war has failed. Yeah. Before, people were afraid to say it. That uh, we, could, we, we had a border patrolman that said that and got fired a couple of months back. Yeah. For his opinion. So, mm -hmm. uh, in the land of free speech, that happens. Wow. Good thing I don't work for the government. <laughs> That's why most of the spokesmen for law enforcement against prohibition are retired. Mm -hmm. Well, before we go too much further, I don't want to miss my book review of the evening, uh, especially since tonight uh, I've got a book that may be the very best one-volume book on addiction I have ever read. It's the In the Realm of the Hungry Ghost by Gabor Mata. Dr. Mata is a physician delivering health services and particularly addiction treatment and management for residents of low-income housing in Vancouver. He's been doing this for a number of years including supervision of methadone therapy. Uh, this is very good on the science of addiction, on the medicine of addiction, but mainly Dr. Mata is an outstanding storyteller, and he has done the best job I have seen of letting these people that he treats and deals with every day, speak for themselves, and tell their own stories. Uh, this is one that uh, will choke you up several times while you read it, and it'll even make you laugh a few times. But if you really want an understanding of what goes on among the hardest of the hardcore drug users, and what the medical outlook is. Uh, Dr. Mata's book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, is a great starting place. It, it's a book well worth looking for and finding. So. Well, um, you, you find so many good books to read. Uh, <laughs> I have a hard time trying to keep up with them. <laughs> well, uh, in Dr. Mata's book, he talks about his addiction to classical music CDs and builds a pretty strong case that it's a real addiction. I would almost put my lifelong habits of book consumption in the same pigeonhole. And in the few years since I have been retired, <laughs> I'm afraid it's gotten out of hand. <laughs> well. But uh, it's what I enjoy doing, and it's amazing how much there still is out there for me to learn. I've barely only started scratching the surface, even of this subject of drugs and drug law. Well, speaking of drugs and drug laws, yes, I mentioned something last uh, program yeah. about um, 12 presidents of South American, Central yeah. American countries. Well, the, uh, the president of Guatemala yeah. is pushing his idea of free passage. Yeah. Uh, he's saying, we've done our share, we're yeah. done. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're parking the problem. 
directly. I guess we have a phone call, guys. Yeah. Hello, caller. Are you there? Hi. Yes, this is Dean. Oh, hi, hi, Dean. Yeah, I just uh, thought I'd check with you guys, see how you're doing. We're doing pretty good. What's been happening over in your world? Well, I, uh, I, I've been watching closely what's been going on up in Canada where they're Oh, thinking about uh, adopting mandatory minimum sentences, uh, somewhat like we do here in the U.S., Yeah. and uh, the involvement of my band of brothers in law enforcement against prohibition, trying to warn them not to follow that same path that we've gone down. Uh, it hasn't panned out too well. What do you guys think? Well, that uh, conservative prime minister elected, what, two years ago now? Mm -hmm. Right. Has has been pushing hard to adopt uh, American drug war style laws, and he's run into a lot of opposition. The courts have given him severe setbacks uh, on medical marijuana. He ran into a real storm when he threatened to close down the safe injection sites in Vancouver. Uh, there's a lot of internal party politics going on in Canada, and the Prime Minister and the Conservative Party has, has chosen the drug laws as, I think, a very poor venue to fight this out. Right. Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is the, uh, the truth keeps stacking up on the side of change. Yeah, because it change meaning uh, lesser sentences and, and uh, fewer arrests. Yeah, but uh, the fact of the matter is there is, a, as you guys talk about all the time, the, the firmly entrenched uh, uh, organizations and outfits that make money. Uh, you know, nineteen different ways, uh, yeah. not just the prison guards or the prison builders, but uh, you know, urine testers and on down the line. Yeah. A lot of people make money out of this drug war. Well, speaking of that, uh, in Canada the government actually grows most of the medical marijuana. Right. They have put, <laughs> as strange as this sounds, they have put a secure marijuana farm inside an underground mine. 500 feet below the And that's, that's the main source for medical marijuana in Canada. If and, I remember right, the name of the mine is Flin Flon, okay. whatever that means, but... Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this, and uh, the, the, the other... Uh, a uh, feature I did on my radio show was uh, playing part of uh, a conference. This actually happened in Dallas last month. Uh, it was a, a one-day conference put together by Mothers Against Teen Violence. And the segment I featured uh, yesterday was uh, Pastor Cl uh, Joseph Clifford. He's uh, a reverend at the Presbyterian Church of Dallas. And he talked about, uh, draw, drew some parallels that basically, how does he want to deal with the drug war? He asked. He ended his uh, his presentation with a question. That was, "What would Jesus do?" And I, I th I'm fairly certain Jesus wouldn't be locking up uh, 1.6 million people a year for plant products in their pocket. <laughs> and especially, he wouldn't be turning them over to, to private prison organizations to show a profit on. Oh, for sure. For sure. And then uh, another feature I did was uh, right here in Texas. I think it's the uh, uh, U.S. Congressional District 16 where Beto O'Rourke yes. uh, is right. trying to take this, uh, the job of, what is his name, Reyes? Is yes. Right? Uh, I believe it's yeah. Reyes, uh, right. who's an ex-DEA agent yeah. or ex-Border yeah, Patrol. And uh, um, he's doing it by way of basically calling for the legalization of marijuana and a very uh, strong restructuring of the drug war in general. Yeah. Well, when, when Beto was a member of the El Paso City Council a couple of years back, he actually got a city resolution passed calling on the federal government to change the drug laws, and then the mayor raised a stink and the council withdrew it. But uh, Beto's been pretty strong on this for a number of years. Well, in the, in, in the segment I ran yesterday, Beto talked about that very instance where the city council voted unanimously yeah. to uh, call for a restructuring of the way we deal with the drug war. Yeah. And then the mayor vetoed it, 
And then the guy who he's trying to replace, is it Ben Reyes? Uh, U.S. Congressman that that there. sounds right. I'm, I'm uh, sure about the Reyes part. Ben, yeah. ben Reyes called each one of the eight council members and told them if they don't change their vote, that federal funding for the city of El Paso was fixing to diminish severely. Yeah. And so they did another vote, and it was four to four. Yeah. And they couldn't they couldn't overturn the mayor's veto, and it was allowed to disappear. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's again strongly <laughs> entrenched interests. Mm-hmm. that uh, insist that this drug war remain the way it is. It's, uh, it's rather, well, it's not rather sad. It's, <laughs> it's very sad. And uh, you guys, I don't know if you've talked about it yet, but uh, coming up on March 8th and 9th at the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy, they're going to have a two-day drug conference. We had just announced that when you showed up on the phone. So well, hey, it sounds it sounds like it's going to be a, a great meeting, yeah. Dean. And what do you think about um, the president from uh, Guatemala? Well, he he's a brave soul. You know, the the thing about it is is that it is going to take some degree of uh, uh, I don't know cooperation, cohesion, so to speak. Numerous countries are going to have to get involved before it will make much difference in stopping uh, the power and, and the profiteering mm-hmm. of the, the these barbarous cartels and the Taliban and, heck, the violent gangs here in the U.S. We've got mm-hmm. to uh, make it at least near uh, global uh, for it to have the proper effect. Yeah. But, uh, the, the, you know, like the president of Guatemala and others in Central and South America who have spoken rather boldly of that need for uh, reexamination of what we're up to. If not outright legalization, some sort of decrim or uh, taxation yeah. or something. Everybody knows, well, a lot of people know we need to do something, yeah. and it's good to see these high echelon politicians saying so. Yeah. Well, Dean, earlier tonight, uh, I stuck my neck out and predicted that with the upcoming elections this November, at least two of the three states that have legalization petitions in the work would legalize. Uh, would you care to join me in pretending to be a fortune teller? Well, I, I would like to address it, certainly. And I, I have great hopes that, that at least one will. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is, and again, those uh, uh, firmly uh, entrenched organizations are going to be fighting tooth and nail and knife fighting in every which way they can. Mm-hmm to try to undo this possibility. Yeah. But uh, it is my hope that uh, through the good work of folks like uh, Safer up there in Denver and, yeah. and uh, uh, perhaps Roger Goodman in Washington State, that uh, the truth can be known and uh, recognized and hopefully uh, broadcast on the airwaves to uh, alert people to the possibility, the need for this change. Well, all three of those states, it is a ballot referendum. It's not legislative. Right. So uh, it's going to be the people who are going to speak their minds. Right. But again, I mean, the cops and the DAs and the the DEA and uh, who knows is uh, going to be involved in trying to scare the people. Yeah. And uh, that's that's what's got to be done is to show that there's nothing to fear. You know, I, th- I think uh, our government is ru- running such shipshod on everybody that people are really now getting set to dig their heels in and say, enough is enough. I, I personally think that all three states, it's going to happen. <laughs> you're more optimistic than either Dean or I. And well, then, I, yeah. I hope you're right, Clay. Yeah. And right after that, you'll see uh, Rhode Island and Maine doing the same damn thing. Well, I, I think uh, you might see Guatemala, and you, yeah. you might see Mexico do the same thing, because yeah. they've been watching us. To, to yeah. they, They've been well aware of these, uh, uh, you know, the attempt last year, uh, in, uh, last cycle in California, yeah. to uh, uh, legalize there. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's going to be so slow, it's going to grate on all three of us, but I think it is slowly unwinding. Yeah. I think it will happen while... At least some of us are still alive. <laughs> it better hurry. <laughs> yeah, I want to still be here and be able okay. to do it uh, on yeah. a good conscience. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Share one with the mayor. Yeah, one, one thing I have been thinking, though, 
is that if California legalizes, there is no way to stop marijuana from California from literally flooding the rest of the United States. Well, They're, they've certainly learned how to grow it well. And, and they should yeah, quite well if it's legal. And the way they grow it and the comparison of internal shipping in the U.S. as opposed to smuggling across the border means that with California especially if they legalize we're going to see a price drop nationwide yes. that to some extent will put the Mexican cartels out of business. And it's going to happen pretty quick. Well, already you can buy a ounce of medical grade marijuana on the street in California for $280 an ounce. That's still a highway robbery. But that's yeah. a hell of a lot better yeah. than what's going on now at $400 yeah. and yeah. 40 and 480 yeah. as you see. Yeah, but but I, I think that, that if that domino tips in November, it's going to happen quicker than any of us predict spreading across the country. Well, I would agree, and that's, that's uh, it's going to be a great benefit to this nation. Yeah. And really, we, we can stop uh, fearing uh, that which, you know, doesn't deserve fear. I mean, uh, you know, marijuana, I, I think, you know, you eat a uh, cookie or two, maybe you shouldn't be on the road there for a couple hours, you yeah. know? Maybe there is a point where mm, there is some incapacitation. Well, you know, uh, all of you listening, go to your medicine cabinet and look at the bottles for all of those pills you take every day and see how many of them, including the over-the-counter hay fever and cold medicines. How many of them say, don't drive or operate heavy machinery while you take this? Right. Now, all of those have a stronger effect on driving than marijuana does. I'm not saying it doesn't have any effect that it doesn't impair you, but all of us have learned to live with drugs that cause moderate impairments. And and I don't think that that worry about marijuana is strong enough that it should cause any concerns. Well, my gosh, uh, Buford, I do that segment on my radio show called Name That Drug by Its Side Effects. Yeah. And uh, the fact of the matter is that I, I see this stuff on my television and it blows me away that some yeah. of this stuff may cause this kind of cancer and yeah. that kind of cancer. Or cause death. Or cause death, the internal bleeding on down the line. And yet they sell this stuff to us. Mm -hmm. oh, and, uh, buyer beware, so to speak. And yet, uh, as you're saying there, Buford, uh, marijuana, well, it, it's a lot less than what those over-the-counter things do. <laughs> and compare it to texting while you drive. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or just being 16 and driving. Yeah. You know, okay. There's a lot of danger there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we, we are winning this slowly, surely. I, I see the, uh, the television now. It's got, good Lord, seven or eight different shows dealing with the drug war, yeah. marijuana. Yeah. Uh, the, the, we have the Prohibition series. We've got, you know, weed wars. Well, speaking uh, of that, I want to interrupt you before we run out of time. Because as soon as we go off the air in just a few minutes, everyone has got a great opportunity to switch over to PBS at 9 o'clock and catch a documentary on Cab Calloway. And not only is Cab and his band fun to watch and listen to, but he's a key figure in the history of American Drug Society. And it, I haven't seen it, but I bet it's worthwhile and if you watch it, pay attention to the lyrics of Minnie the Mooch. Sorry to interrupt you, Dean, but I want oh, to get that in. Uh, uh, I saw Cap. He was actually on uh, the, one of the Blues Brothers movies. Yeah. Uh, singing Minnie the Moocher. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, do pay attention to those words, friend. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I tell you what, for uh, this coming weekend, I don't have my show scheduled out uh, other than um, I'm going to try to talk to some folks up in Colorado 
Uh, I'm going to okay. see if I can get a hold of Mason Tavert, who heads up Safer, the group that's uh, sponsoring right. their legalization effort up there. Yeah. And uh, maybe a reporter with the Denver Post to kind of get a pulse on what's going on and uh, see see how it's going up that way. That sounds great. And we can find you on the radio where? Okay. Uh, Sunday evenings, you can hear me on KPFT, which is 90.1 FM. Uh, shows begin at 6.30, last till 7.30 p.m., feeds out then to 90-plus other broadcast stations in the U.S. and okay. Canada. Okay. Thank you, Dean. Well, thank you, guys. Keep up the good work. Okay. And before we go tonight, uh, I want to give you my usual admonition to let your representatives, both in Washington and Austin, let you know, let them know how you feel about what's going on and I want to repeat what we said earlier tonight. Even if he's not, you're not in his district, or it'd be better to say, even if he is not the representative for your district, call Lamar Smith and let him know you're not going to put up with the kind of nonsense about marijuana He's trying to cram through the Congress. You want to uh, rant a little bit before yeah, we Yeah, uh, my thing is, if they're in office, they haven't worked well for us, we need to vote those people that don't represent us out of office and be done with them. Um, you know, if we did a wholesale change on these representatives, our message would really start to get through right here in Texas. Okay. Well, that about wraps it up for this evening. Remember, this is your show. We love to hear from you. And we'll back to talk some more about drugs, crime, and politics in, in two, two weeks. weeks. So good night and thank you. Uh, I began to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. Damn prohibition, which can only mean one thing. Legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. We really want to improve our urban neighborhoods. The most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do.